pleasure to address the opening of today's webinar on the topic the industrial relations code 2020 accredited the industrial relations code 2020 is one of the four codes that become a part of the largest labor laws reforms in decades the code subsumes three major central laws enactments one the industrial disputes act 1947 the trades union act 1926 and the industrial employment standing orders act 1948 new new additions and have been introduced in this to simplify and add more structures to the existing regulations but this is a welcoming reform but often the denied lies in the details therefore it is necessary to analyze the scheme of the court and examine the historical perspective of the existing labor enactments on this note and on behalf of school of law sharda university i express my gratitude to esteemed professor bt kolsa for accepting our invitation and wish all the participants a fruitful discussion now i would like to request dean school of law sharda university professor dr pradeep kulshreshtha sir to kindly welcome sir and say few words thank you very much uh, dear anurudh uh, it is my privilege and distinct honor to welcome honorable professor bt kol sir he is well known uh, professor of law he was uh, formerly professor of law at delhi university and also he held chairperson uh, delhi judicial academy uh, role under uh, delhi high court and in both the roles sir's uh, achievements have been outstanding second to none and rather he has set very high benchmarks for others to follow and uh, i am uh, personally privileged to be under the uh, guidance and mentoring of sir and i on my own behalf and on behalf of the management faculty non teaching staff students and the participants uh, heartily uh, welcome sir in this webinar on code on industrial relations 2020 equity the center for excellence in uh, labor and industrial laws uh, cli has taken a very good initiative by inviting sir who is a legal luminary of very high order and he is also an authority on the topic as uh, uh, the keynote speaker in this webinar professor bt call uh, is a fine human being and he is uh, a legendary mentor also and uh, i am thankful to sir that have, uh, because of his mentoring we have uh, professor uh, uh, rohin call as our faculty member and this is one of the uh, great quality which we faculty can emulate from our seniors that they are fine uh, professors as well as they are very good human being they go out of their way to mentor the students and they take care they, so the relationship between uh, teacher and student is not only uh, during the uh, class time or during the uh, program time it is for life so that that one thing i really admire and i try to emulate so thank you very much sir for being uh, our mentor and our guide we are so fortunate with these words i once again welcome you sir uh, in this webinar uh, thank you uh, professor uh, kulshreshtra it's a pleasure again to be back and address your students uh, in the school of uh, law i'm sure uh, uh, they must be uh, working very hard on understanding the nuances of this law which still has to come into operation the act has been passed uh, but uh, question is whether it will be operationalized a million dollar question i do not know because uh, in the past also we have had many such attempts to bring in a new law but i think uh, for one reason or other reason things did not materialize i hope and trust that uh, this time as uh, the opening uh, speaker said that uh, this is uh, to consolidate the labor laws into four courts at the central level and uh, this is uh, primarily to bring uh, some sort of a, a uniformity in the law in its application in four domains one is uh, industrial relations 
second is wages third is social security fourth is you know seek this uh, uh what we call as uh, safety measures and welfare measures uh, code that will be uh, operationalized if it comes into force but i think the as a student of labor law one must understand uh, the preamble to the code i'll be confining my discussion only to the industrial relations code 2020 and this is where you will find first i must say that labor is a subject matter which comes in the which falls in the uh, third list that is concurrent list on which both center and states can make law and uh, in case of inconsistency between center and state law uh, central law prevails but if it has got the prior presidential assent then the state law will prevail this is an attempt on the part of the central government in fact parliament to uh, give a uniform law at least three legislations which are being dealt with by this code uh, industrial relations code are being uh, what they call it in the preamble, consolidating. They are consolidating three legislations. Uh, that is, Industrial Relations uh, Code consolidates Trade Unions Act 1926, Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946, and the Industrial Disputes Act 1947. Now, till now, uh, we had uh, different... Uh, approaches of the courts whether they formed part of the same code or not but i think time has come now the differences have been sorted out and i think we have been now told that they form part of the same code and now they are consolidated and amended the, that law in the three legislations has been consolidated in this code and those legislations at appropriate stages have also been amended now that is the basic point that i just wanted to make now the purpose is the purpose is uh, to uh, have a uniform law on industrial relations at the central level and to provide uh, definitions which are uniform definitions which can apply to all the three legislations iron out the difficulties that were faced in operationalizing those three legislations earlier make amendments to the law uh, so as to make it uh, you know uh, timely and also to me meet the felt necessities of the time you must be always uh, uh, hearing that uh, indian law one of the criticism is that it is not very flexible and then trying to bring some flexibility i do not know how far they have succeeded in that i think that is what we have to study over the period of time but the fact of the matter is that there are many changes that have been brought in whether good or bad that is for us to examine as a uh, uh, students, as uh, teachers, as uh, researchers in law, we must examine and tell the lawmakers as to where they have done a good job, where they have not done a good job, where they could have done a better job. And I think that's one, one of the basic responsibilities that we have to shoulder and we have to discharge that responsibility. It is in that context that today I'm talking to you on this subject. Let me first give you a background uh, of why uh, we are talking about the Industrial Relations Code 2020. As I said, uh, three legislations are being subsumed into this code. One is the Trade Unions Act 1926, second is the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act, and third is the Industrial Disputes Act 1947. Just to give you a small uh, introductory, uh, uh, you know, uh, introduction to the subject of these three legislations. Now, Trade Unions Act uh, was basically brought in to legitimize formation of trade unions because prior to this uh, act, uh, trade unions were per se not considered to be lawful bodies. There were many cases in, uh, in England where to begin with, uh, trade unions came to be treated as Ill illegal bodies. So to gain that legitimacy, the struggle that the workers had to undergo was very very uh, you know difficult struggle they had to face through many trials and tribulations to attain the status of the legitimacy now india was a, a country where it was primarily agrarian economy but i think uh, slowly gradually we developed certain areas uh, where industry started coming up and therefore the workforce which was employed in those industry naturally 
needed to be taken care of and they needed to be uh, you know given some rights which were necessary uh, for the purposes of ensuring that these people have humane conditions of work now as you all know uh, we individually cannot bargain for better terms unless we have collective strength to bargain for better terms and when you are uh, united you stand together if you stand together uh, if you unite you have a better strength if you do not unite you do not have that strength that is the basic presumption that is the basic premise of labor law labor law is a collective law that's what we talk about is a, a people it's a, a law which has to talk about the collective rights collective bargaining substituting the individual bargaining that is what the purpose of the trade unions act primarily is but this act was passed at a time in a hurried manner because at that time india was both having problems on the uh, labor front also we had the uh, fight for the uh, you know uh, independence of the country the people who were leading the independence movement were also Uh, at the forefront of the trade union movement in this country a legislation came to be made in the form of trade unions act but it did not deal with entirety of the trade union law because if you see the uh, preamble to the trade unions act itself it says an act to provide for registration of trade unions and in certain matters define law relating to registered trade unions now you will from the very preamble say it says to define the law in certain matters not in all matters because you will see that the trade unions act 1926 did not deal with a very very important aspect uh, in fact two three important aspects that is what we talk about uh, collective bargaining it did not talk about recognition of trade unions which is a sign qua non for uh, good collective bargaining it did not provide for prevention of unfair labor practices these three very important areas were left out perhaps in the hope that in future we'll be able to bring these changes in the law and introduce these law on this subject these three subjects to make it a very very comprehensive law so that collective bargaining takes place as the primary mode of dispute resolution in this country this was done in 1947 1947 and this is where i would say the students and the teachers of the labor law must go through that amendment that amendment brought in all these three aspects and became part of the statute but this uh, statute which uh, amendment which became part of the statute was not enforced with the result that uh, you know it could not become the law of the land in operation though it became a part of the statute book in the country this was something which was attempted to be done on the basis of national labor relations act 1930 five of the united states if that had uh, been operationalized i am sure today the indian economy indian uh, industry indian uh, you know strength in the uh, international trade perhaps would have been much better off because it would be a comprehensive law dealing with all aspects which were needed to strengthen trade unions and to strengthen harmony in the industry relations i think this could not become the law but i will demonstrate over the period of time if we get that time uh, that judiciary in india played a very pivotal role especially around and after we attained independence in this country and they took judicial notice of these amendments and built up judi judgment law on uh, you know unfair labor practices Uh, till they were brought in in the statute book in 1982 through the amendment in the industrial disputes act 1947 but i'll come to that later on i'm only trying to tell you that trade unions act initially when it was enacted was not a complete code in itself it was a piecemeal legislation dealing only with the registration of trade unions it dealt with what are the rights of the recognized registered trade unions but did not deal with the question of recognition of trade union therefore that very important area was left out and in india today because the code has not yet come into force we are still governed at the national level at the central level by a voluntary code of discipline which deals with the recognition of trade unions a very very strange phenomenon that we will uh, like to uh, highlight at this stage 
Now, at core of the trade union law is the three immunities that are given under the Trade Unions Act 1926. And those are very, very beautiful uh, provisions you must look at. I'm sure your teachers will definitely take you to those uh, three areas and on which there are a beautiful case laws that has uh, developed over the period of time. Those are section 16, 17, and 18. Section 16 gives immunity from criminal conspiracy simpliciter to the registered trade union their office bearers and members against uh, you know a conspiracy per se uh, in furtherance of the agreements uh, which are to further the legitimate trade union objectives specified in section 15 of the trade union act unless the agreement is an agreement to commit an offense uh, you will read that Ruiker versus emperor is one of the very beautiful cases that you should look at but i will not be able to devote much time on that i'm only trying to highlight why was there a need for uh, having an industrial relations code 2020 and second is a very important area is section 17 uh, is about uh, immunity against uh, tortious liabilities and that is again available to the registered trade unions their office based members in contemplation furtherance of the trade dispute and uh, that's a very beautiful Rothas Industry Staff Association versus State of Bihar, which is a case which is a must for every student of labor law. You must go through Krishnaya's judgment of 1976. Of course, even the Patna High Court from which the appeal came, that judgment of 1962 from the Patna High Court is equally important judgment. And I think both these judgments must be read by the students. And third is 18 is restraint of trade. Now, this is to highlight the fact that restraint of trade every you know collective bargaining agreement or a demand of a trade dispute can result in a restraint of trade and restraint of trade is wide and uh, but an exception has been made under section 18 in respect of the registered trade union their office bearers and members that even if they make a demand for something which may result in restraint of trade as long as it is for the lawful trade union objectives it will not be wide it will be valid. Now, that is a very important aspect that you must look at, which you will see that code has uh, brought these three all immunities back and they are retained in the code. But uh, just uh, to tell you that this was uh, all that was uh, talked about in the Trade Unions Act because registration of trade union either under the code or under the Trade Unions Act is voluntary. You have a choice to make yourself registered trade union, get yourself registered, but you are not under a legal compulsion to get a trade union registered. But registration is a sign qua non for recognition. There may be many registered trade unions, but there has to be at a given point of time only one uh, recognized trade union. It's like a political party, uh, different political parties in the parliament. Uh, they are registered with the election commission, but there is only one recognized a political party which has the majority on the house in the house which becomes the government of india and that becomes the government for all the people of india and whenever it takes a decision it takes a decision for all the people of india similarly you have to say political democracy and industrial democracy have many things in common and that is what you should keep in mind now one two three things that i just want to highlight and that is why i want to uh, take the discussion forward is this Trade Unions Act did not provide for recognition of trade unions, but the code, uh, as we will see, has a definition uh, which uh, you can look at in section, uh, I think, uh, 2, yeah, it is in section 2Z. Uh, which defines negotiating union and negotiating council. And provision for this uh, determination of negotiating council and negotiating union is made uh, in uh, section 14 of the code. So you will have a look at section 14. But it is very unfortunate. That is what I am trying to say. Critique of this law is when I am dealing with the trade unions, like I say the provisions of the trade unions like, which have been brought into the code have now added provision of recognition of trade unions. But this provision is a half-hearted attempt to bring this law in India because there is only one provision, section 14, 
and section 14 provides for establishment of recognized trade union at the industrial establishment level now industrial establishment level means you are providing for recognition only at the industrial establishment level but there are issues whether we should encourage uh, recognition at the industrial establishment level or we should uh, you know recognize uh, trade unions at the industry level in a region or we should uh, allow its recognition at the national level especially when we talk about the service sector you must have seen all banks have their unions at the national level and when they bargain they bargain at the national level insurance companies which is a, again a service sector they have unions at the national level because all service sectors are basically developing unions at the national level therefore i would say that this uh, law which has been incorporated has many lacunas uh, many lacunas in the sense because it only provides for recognition at the industrial establishment level second very serious objections that i have is that this law provides for eligibility conditions you know if there is a trade union only trade union one trade union industrial establishment it must have 51 percent of the members uh, workers as its members that's too high a benchmark uh, to lay down for getting recognition of trade unions i think india is one country where there is low density of membership in the trade Therefore, to ask for 51% uh, of the workers, or there are many trade unions, but it says 51% of the workers must be members of that union, and their that verification or whatever mode is decided to find the 51% eligibility condition. I think none of the trade unions will fulfill this condition. Therefore, it may be law in paper, but in working, it cannot be. It also provides for negotiating counsel. Suppose there is no trade union which has 51% workers, then different trade unions, if they have minimum uh, uh, you know, membership of 20%, they will be entitled to one membership. Therefore, suppose there are five trade unions and each having 20% of the membership, that means each will have one representative in the negotiating council and they will be able to negotiate on behalf of the workers and again i have my doubts whether a union can have 20 percent of the uh, minimum eligibility conditions fulfilled keeping in view that uh, you know that the, this is a two, two, this is this is a country where uh, workers uh, becoming members of the trade union is itself a big challenge now i would also like to draw your attention to something very important when we talk about uh, you know a collective bargaining agreement that is the primary duty of a negotiating uh, union or a negotiating council now if you go to the definition of settlement that has been given in the legislation section 2 zi is the definition of a settlement and this has been a matter which has been agitated under the uh, industrial dispute act 1947 in many cases before the supreme court and supreme court has dealt with this cases in different ways in different cases because it says settlement it recognizes settlements of two kinds one is settlement which is arrived at otherwise than through the conciliation machinery and second is the settlement which is arrived at through the conciliation machine now if a settlement is arrived at without the help of the conciliation machinery that will be a settlement between the negotiating union or negotiating council and the management but it says it will be binding only on the uh, people uh, members who are parties to that settlement so therefore even a majority union if it enters into a settlement it is not a settlement in terms of the definition of section 2 which will bind all the workers so therefore this is an area which again needs to be looked at and this definition of settlement needs to be recast or a separate provision has to be made in case of collective bargaining agreements their binding nature their enforceability that is an area which has been left out i think section 14 is the only section which i could see in this uh, code which deals with the recognition of trade unions and i submit that this has not been very well dra drafted it leaves many issues uh, undecided and you, it does not even define what are the rights of the recognized trade union what are the rights of the unrecognized trade union therefore there is much desire 
to be desired, which has to be ended. I looked at the rules. I thought maybe that if the main provision is uh, section is not providing for these uh, problems, but maybe that the rules provide for them. But the rules as they have, uh, you know, put on the website, I found those rules make no provision on these gaps which you find in law of recognition of trade unions. Maybe over the period of time, they may come with more uh, rules which will deal with these gaps. But I think uh, this is a matter. We may be very happy that uh, we are bringing a law on recognition of trade unions, but we have not brought the law on scientific basis, innovative basis, on healthy basis. And we have put eligil eligibility conditions, which are very high eligibility conditions, which may not be satisfied by the trade unions in the present scenario when trade unions are not finding density of membership in this country because now uh, workers are basically interested in getting their individual rights strengthened rather than collective rights strengthened because the security of employment is a big issue and employment of the people in the industry is itself a big issue and COVID-19 has shown us how people have lost jobs, how difficult it is for the people to get back the jobs. First wave brought in disaster, second wave again brought some disaster because movement from village from city to the villages or industrial towns to the villages started then there was a movement from villages back to the industrial towns but then second wave started there was again a movement and therefore disruption in the employments disruption in the economy these are very very important areas that we should look at and i have my very very strong doubts about this aspect of the matter and that is why I am a very worried person and I am not very sure whether this code ultimately in this form will be accepted uh, or is uh, going to be uh, you know, a very uh, good uh, uh, code uh, in the sense that it develops a scientific temperament in framing this legislation. I don't think so. This area needs to be uh, further uh, you know, dealt with. Second area of disappointment for me is to which I will go, but let me continue with my historical perspective. One was the Trade Unions Act 1926, and I told you uh, how uh, we have uh, tried to uh, amend that law in 1947, which again did not become uh, enforceable law, but now we are trying to bring in the code, uh, this kind of a situation, which I think uh, brings in recognition law, which brings unfair labor practices law on the lines which have we have under the Industrial Disputes Act, but I think there is uh, still some, as I pointed out, these areas need to be attended to. These areas are very important areas. Recognition is the backbone of a good industrial relation law. And if your backbone is not well structured, it is not well drawn, I think it will remain a weak law. It will remain more dis, you know, area litigated in the courts because suppose there's a dispute about the eligibility condition. How do we resolve those eligibility conditions? I think we should again go back to 1947 amendment to the Trade Unions Act. I think that was much better attempt on the part of the legislature to bring in a very, very scientifically based uh, recognition law. And I think that needs to be again looked at. Second legislation, which I just want to talk about, is the legislation dealing with Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act. You know, at present in the law, industrial employment standing orders, there's a schedule. Those are the areas on which every employer employing 100 or more workmen on any day in a uh, given day in a calendar, 12 calendar months, he is obliged to get his uh, standing orders certified by the authority under the act. And they become uniform laws applicable on those subject matters. And one of the purposes of that was implied conditions of service must be uniform as far as possible, because that brings in harmony, that brings in satisfaction among the workers, that one is not discriminated against other, one is not being paid less, or one is not given better conditions of service than others. So therefore, Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act is a very important legislation, which is giving uniformity conditions of uniformity conditions of service uniform conditions of service and those areas are cover covering those areas you have to have standing uh, standing orders certified by the authority and there is a model standing orders 
drawn under the egg and those model uh, standing orders are in uh, you know uh, reflection which must be they they must be reflected as far as practicable in your draft standing orders which need to be certified by the authority two changes which have taken place one is not a good change second is a good change one change that has taken place is that now 100 or more workmen is now replaced by 300 so therefore if you are working in an industrial establishment where there are less than two uh, 300 workers you need not to get your standing orders certified which again is a matter of great concern because then it gives scope to the employer to bring in you know in disparity in conditions of employment but good thing about the industrial employment standing orders act is that it now time limits the certifying authorities that within a given period of time they must decide the question of certification of standing orders and if they do not decide within that period it shall be presumed that standing orders stand certified now this is a very good uh, because one of the greatest criticism against uh, the authorities empowered to certify standing orders under the act was that they would for extraneous considerations keep the files pending and would work on them only when you know those considerations were satisfied and many a times the employers had to go to the high courts through writ petitions and get directions to the certifying authorities and it would take years and years for getting the certified standing orders certified under the act now that is a very very important development that has taken place and i think that is one thing we should appreciate now let me come uh, to uh, the main uh, law that i think we should be talking about today and that law is what we should be talking about how changes have brought in in the industrial dispute sake and one of the important areas that you must have seen that industrial dispute sake was not supposed to be the primary mode of dispute resolution in india it was supposed to be a standby arrangement in case the collective bargaining does not succeed state cannot be an onlooker and it must provide a machinery which is a specialized machinery and that was in the form of conciliation and adjudication where first conciliation mediation then adjudication adjudication again under the industrial dispute set can be voluntary adjudication as voluntary arbitration or through labor courts industrial tribunal national labor tribunal depending upon the uh, subject matter of adjudication now i just wanted to uh, bring in some very important things you know industrial disputes act applies only to the industries industry as defined in the industrial disputes act. and this concept has been a subject matter of great litigation before the supreme court in fact the supreme court is today seized up a matter re, uh, revisiting the definition of industry under the industrial dispute sake and that is before a constitution bench of nine judges it has not yet heard this matter but the reference to the nine judges have already been made as to what uh, how should they revisit the definition of industry as defined in bangalore water supply case and i'm sure all of you will be reading that case because that is a very very important case and that brings in a discussion of all the cases decided till 78 and that was the case which was decided in 78 and that was followed in the later cases because it was a, a you know a very uh, important judgment of i think five judges who decided no it was seven judges bench because subdarjing hospital was six judges bench Justice Hidayatullah headed the Sabdarajan Hospital Six Judges Bench. Therefore, to consider all cases uh, up to Sabdarajan and thereafter till Bangalore Water Supply, Supreme Court had constituted a seven judges bench, and that judgment, main judgment, has been delivered by Justice Krishna Iyer. And you will have that judgment, a very beautiful judgment that he has uh, given. I'm sure all students will. But I think, you know, very important aspect that I would say after the judgment of the supreme court in bangalore water supply there was an attempt to amend the definition of industry and in 1982 section 2j of the industrial dispute act was amended and it was amended certain activities which were held to be industry were specifically excluded because they thought hospitals uh, educational institutions research centers 
they thought they will bring a new legislation to deal with the disputes in those cases, but they would not be the subject matter of adjudication under the Industrial Disputes Act. That legislation was never drawn, though that amendment of 82 again was a part of the statute book, but it was never enforced. But now the, uh, in the code, we have the definition of industry. If you find uh, it is now defined in Section 2P, therefore what was in Section 2J of the Industrial Disputes Act 1947 has been now defined as an industry under the uh, Section 2P of the 2020 code. And Section 22P of the code has to be read along with Section 2R. Section 2R defines what is industrial undertaking and industrial establishment. Now, this is a separate category that they have taken in this. And this is, in fact, the part of the judgment of the Supreme Court in Bangalore Water Supply. Now, the cases that went to the Supreme Court from 1953 onwards, starting with DNB Energy, Corporation of Nagpur, uh, Bar Bar Baroda Municipality, uh, Hospital Mazdur Sabha, Solicitor's case, Delhi University's case, Jim Khana Club's case, then uh, Sabdarjang Hospital's case, and then finally uh, Bangalore Water Supply case, which reviewed all these judgments. Now, the Supreme Court in that case said what is important that there must be a systematic activity. In that systematic activity, there must be cooperation between employer and workers. And that cooperation between employers and workers must be to provide serv services and goods to the society at large, including material services, but not spiritual uh, services or religious services. But at the same time, it said if prashad is prepared on a large scale in a gurdwara and employees are employed for preparing this prashad, it can become an industry. It also said profit motive is not an essential element. It also said investment of capital is not an essential element, and it also made a distinction between welfare functions and the sovereign functions of the state. Now, it held in that case, education institutions are industry, government run hospitals are industry, non proprietary club where large number of employees are employed. You know, I'm talking about the Jim Khanna Club case. It overruled the Jim Khanna Club case and said non proprietary clubs are also industry. So therefore, the question that arose after Bangalore Water Supply is not what is an industry, question arose what is not an industry. And you find in Section 22J uh, amended in 1982, many of the activities which the Supreme Court held were covered by the industry definition were excluded in the hope that they will bring a new legislation as I referred to it earlier, that uh, definition uh, excluded those activities, like I said, uh, educational institutions, hospitals, uh, and uh, also they said research institutes. But today, if you see this definition, I'm very pained to read this definition. I'm very pained to tell you that this definition is completely cut and paste with non application of mine. And if you allow me, just I will like your. Uh, professors to kindly have a look at it so that when they take this subject in the classroom, uh, they are able to bring those nuances which I want you to look at. Now kindly see this definition is in given section 2P and I think on this basis itself, this code needs to be revisited. This code must be placed before the specialist of the subject, not BT call. People who have vast experience of research, academics, and people from the industry, people from the working uh, workers side, there must be a strong body of people who are well-meaning people. They must sit down because it is the heart of the matter because it will be on the basis of this definition that code's application will depend. If the code does not define industry in a proper manner, it is not laying down a good foundation for building up a good industrial relations code in this country. My submission is this. It says industry means any systematic activity carried on by the cooperation between employer and workmen. Now that is specifically what the 
Bangalore Water Supply also said. Then it says whether such worker is employed by such employer directly or by through an agency, including a contractor. Now, my problem is when you say worker, worker you have defined in the act itself. And that brings in the relationship, master and servant relationship. Contract of service, not contract for service. So you cannot call them as workers if they're employed through a contractor. That is the first point where I would like the teachers to look at this definition. You can say people employed through contractors, persons employed through contractors, but you can't say workers employed through contractors because worker, when you go to the definition of worker in the Industrial Disputes Act, you, in, this, in this act itself, that is defined in section ZR. And ZR says, means a person employed in an industry. Employed means where there's a master and servant, whether the contract of employment is expressed or implied. So therefore, first point, I want to draw attention of my students, my colleagues to this very concept at the outset. Second, that is one aspect of the matter. Second, for the production, supply distribution of goods or services with a view to satisfy human wants and wishes this is what bangalore water supply said not being wants or wishes which are merely spiritual or religious in nature whether or not any capital has been invested for the purpose of carrying such activity such activity is carried without any motive to make gains or profits now if profit motive is not essential if profit motive is not a determining factor, how can you exclude in the next line charitable institutions, social institutions, philanthropic institutions? I am not able to reconcile. There's a dichotomy in the definition itself. And I can tell you that much of the activities that come before the court are claimed to be charitable institutions, but people are making a lot of profits in the name of the charities. And Krishna Iyer in Bangalore Water Supply said, charity should begin at home. You must be first charitable to your employees. You must ensure that you look after the welfare of the employees, give them better service conditions before you start doing it for the society as a whole. So therefore, my problem with the definition is it doesn't talk about the education institutions, it doesn't talk about the hospitals, it doesn't talk about the research institute, meaning thereby what has been held by the Supreme Court in Bangalore or supply holds good today. Universities, schools are industry, hospitals, whether government run or private hospitals are industry, research centers are industry. Therefore, what was achieved, tried to be achieved by 82 amendment, I think that aspect has been completely overlooked and I do not know it is a very hastily drawn definition and I think the problems are very many and uh, itself on this point I would certainly like this definition to be recast relooked and looked from the perspective of whether we should have uh, a better definition than what has been provided which I think I find is one there's a dichotomy in it Second, this is a cut and paste definition with non-application of mind, and there is no scientific basis for this kind of a definition in the industrial dispute sake. That is one of the other aspects that I couldn't say. Now, in Bangalore Water Supply case, Supreme Court applied two tests, and that you find in the definition in section 2R. It said, welfare activities, if they fulfill the triple test, are industries but sovereign functions strictly speaking are not industries because they are they are not they are inalienable functions of the constituent government wars cannot be merchantable justice cannot be saleable is what justice krishna Iyer said in bangalore water supply case so what is strictly sovereign is something which private individual cannot undertake is the essential function of a constituent government. Welfare function is that can be taken up by private industry. It can be taken up by government. Running up hospitals, government hospitals is a welfare activity, not a sovereign function of the state. 
running of educational institution is a welfare activity it's not a sovereign activity of the state but justicing and fighting wars are you know absolute police law and order these are all sovereign functions of the state maintenance of law and order is a sovereign function of the state collection of tax re uh, revenues of the state perhaps is a sovereign function of the state are not to be related to the confused with the welfare functions of the state so that is something which needs but when we go to section 2r the legislature has tried to parliament has tried to bring in two important features of the bangalore water supply case and that is where the court had said predominant activity test and the severability test and they applied predominant activity test in delhi university they said teachers may not be workmen they did not test whether they are workmen or not this is assuming teachers are not workmen but the predominant activity that is carried on industry in the university fleet of buses you have staff ministerial staff you have other people working clerks you have people working in offices you have all these people gard gardeners malis mistaris everybody there predominantly it is industrial maybe some of them are not workmen therefore you apply this predominant activity test some of them may not classify as workmen therefore may not be entitled to the benefit of the industrial dispute say then they said severability test even in sovereign functions there may be certain departments like prison is a sovereign function of the state but in prison also there may be certain activities like malis mistaris or supreme court canteen so those may be people who may be uh, doing systematic activity carrying uh, cooperation with the employer and employee to provide tea and coffee to the people who come to attend cases in the supreme court or the lawyers and other people who come to the supreme court so you apply the severability test so therefore that is the aspect that has been taken care of by uh, section 2r therefore section 2p and section 2r are the matters which are necessarily to be taken together but i think in the ultimate analysis my submission is that the industry definition needs to be recast now let me come very quickly to the definition of worker earlier we had section 2a in the industrial disputes act we talked about workman now they have replaced the word workman by worker now worker has the same definition except that two changes that have been brought up is that it has brought in uh, what we call as uh, working journalists were governed by their own act they were not covered by the industrial disputes act though the disputes that they would arise under that act would be uh, treated as industrial disputes but what they have done now is working journalists are workmen for the purposes of the act similarly sales representatives because if you remember sandos case which was a constitution bench judgment just a savans judgment you will see that in that case the court had held that sales representatives are not workmen but now the new definition has brought in sales representatives also within the definition of worker now that is where it has ambit uh, widened the ambit of uh, the definition of worker rest is what is section 2s of the industrial dispute but a very important thing that i would like to talk about if you go to the last para of section of the definition of worker in section 2 zr for the purposes of chapter 3 which deals with the trade unions the definition of worker has been expanded and what was the definition of workman in the trade unions act worker has been retained and you will see that it provided that for the purposes of chapter 3 this is what you have to many teachers i would say with respect were not able to bring this distinction when they would deal with the registration of trade unions who is the workman they would go to the industrial dispute say no there was a definition of worker in the trade unions all persons employed in trade or industry whether or not in the employment of the employer with whom the trade dispute arises in section 2g there was at the trade dispute at the bottom was the definition of worker now that definition has been brought in here 
it has been made a part of the definition of worker but only for the purpose of chapter 3 that is for registration of trade unions and there is a important another aspect that has been to be taught to the students and that's where a very important change has come in it says provided for the purposes of chapter 3 worker means all persons employed in trade or industry all persons even managing director can also be a worker a supervisory staff can also be worker manager can also be a worker administrator can also be a worker includes worker as defined in section 2m of the unorganized workers security social security act now this is where i think you will have a wider people now getting into the trade union law getting their trade unions registered though they may not be strictly worker within the meaning of uh, you know Uh, section two, uh, what what we have the definition in that sense where there's a contract of employment, two Z R. But I think now this is where liberalisation are uh, bringing people who were uh, you know covered by an organised sector have also been brought within the definition of worker for the purpose of formation of trade unions. But my caveat is here. In nineteen seventy eight, there was a law. which did not again uh, become a law but attempt was made on the basis of the recommendations of the second national labor law Com uh, labor commission that was varma committee report first report was in 69 of justice gajendra gadkar committee report which i think is one of the foundation uh, laying down the jurisprudence labor jurisprudence in this country and must be a compulsory reading for every teacher and student of labor law go to the net go to the first labor commission report is a beautiful comprehensive encyclopedia indian encyclopedia on labor laws and it is a uh, lay it is a report prepared by justice gajendra gadkar who was one of the main architects in the supreme court who formulated a wonderful labor jurisprudence in this country up to nine up to the time he was there i think the last case we hear from him was a uh, hospital mazdoor sabha case i think meher's case delhi university case was also one of the cases that dealt with by him he was one of those wonderful judges who had at some point of time gone ahead then retracted back then gone ahead then retracted back perhaps looking at the indian scenario was not too sure what should be included what should not be included but whatever he could do he has been he has done a wonderful uh, uh, no contribution in the development of the labor jurisprudence in this country therefore his uh, contribution in the form of the first national commission labor uh, report on uh, national uh, commission on labor report of 1969 is a wonderful document which must i think is a book of all times and must be read by all students and all teachers but i'll just come to this i was coming to the varma committee report 19 78 there was a legislation which was attempted to be made granting protection to the supervisory and managerial cadre why should a supervisor become a member of a trade union why should a manager become a member of a trade union why should the administrators become members of the trade union when they have no protection if you become a member of the trade union you become a sore in the eyes of the employer and therefore uh, by giving them wider definition of workman so that they become members of the trade union without any protection after that that i think is not a very very good uh, thing to do this must code should have provided a chapter providing some protection to these people if they were to be included in the definition of uh, worker for the purposes of trade unions act i think that's another uh, critique that i would like definitely to make about the uh, whole thing then other aspect that i would like certainly like to go is uh this court abolishes the institution of court of inquiry this court abolishes the institution of labor courts this institution this court also abolishes a concept called board of conciliation this court also abolishes the scope of the reference there is no reference provision like section 10 of the industrial disputes act which is so much of litigated area before the courts because 
the main argument was that the political party in power would only refer the matters of the uh, unions which were affiliated to the party in power. So that was one of the criticisms. Now it is only in case of national labor tribunals, national uh, industrial tribunals, that a reference power has been given to the central government. Those are disputes which are of national importance or concerning workers in more than one state on the subject matters of industrial dispute. Now that is another aspect that I would like to, but I would like certainly to say that uh, there are section 2ZN talks about the industrial tribunal, which has to be constituted in accordance with section 24, section 44. And it also talks about the national industrial tribunal constituted under section 46. Now, till this time, we have only one presiding officer, and that is a judicial officer. Senior experienced officers from judiciary having minimum experience of seven years or 10 years. They were the presiding officers to be appointed of the labor courts or industrial tribunals. But this court now brings in a concept that there shall be two members of the tribunal. One will be a judicial member, second will be an administrative member. And it lays down the qualifications for those. Now, my worry is, Though this act was prepared, was drafted, was framed, was brought in to provide inexpensive, expeditious disposal of cases by specialized bodies. But over the period of time, we find that there's a lot of delay involved in adjudication of the industrial disputes as of today. Now, when you have two members, one administrative and one judicial member, I think the delay is going to be more. Delay is going to be more because there has to be concurrence, consensus, decision has to be consensus. And if the two do not agree, then appropriate government has to make reference to the third member. That will be a judicial member. If central administrative tribunals working is any experience, it has been a very, very sad experience, both quality and quantity wise. I hope we again rethink on this whole issue and I have a, a suggestion to make. And that suggestion is this. We must instead create a cadre of presiding officers of lawyers who have experience or judicial officers who have the experience of some years in the courts, but are caught when they are young. And they are trained regular basis about the constitutional values, importance of fundamental rights, importance of directive principles of state policy, interdisciplinary subjects like economics, sociology, and law. And they are trained to preside over the industrial tribunal and national labor tribunal. There is no need to have two members because we don't want these tribunals to become a cushion for the executive to position themselves after their retirement in the tribunals. We want experienced, we want well-qualified, well-oriented officers who will be a cadre and will only serve as labor industrial tribunal and national labor tribunal presiding officers, not repatriable back to the judiciary because they will come for two years, three years. By the time they learn labor law, they are transferred back or they are repatriated back to the uh, civil or uh, criminal side. I think this is my very, very sincere uh, suggestion that should be uh, discussed with the students, should be discussed in the seminars, discussed among us, the faculty members, why not to create a cadre of officers who are trained in labor laws, who exclusively deal with the labor matters and are therefore up to date with the knowledge 
and the social issues, social problems, industry problems, industrial issues, industrial disputes, their nature and their significance. That is something which needs to be looked at and that needs to be examined. I think this is my sincere suggestion. This, this uh, needs to be again uh, re-looked and I would certainly like you to have a look at this aspect. And third aspect that I would again like to go back. You see, there was a case called uh, Trade Fair Authority of India, B.R. Singh versus Trade Fair Authority of India. Justice Ahmadi's judgment. A very beautiful case where the judge says, though collective bargaining is not a fundamental right, though strike is not a fundamental right, right to form association is a fundamental right, right to peaceably demonstrate is a fundamental right, of course, subject to the reasonable restrictions. It said that collective bargaining has come to be recognized as a legal right of the workers. So has the strike in order to give vent to their grievances after having exhausted all other avenues available to them. So therefore, strike, though not a statutory right, is a common law right. Unless it is taken away by the statute, it remains with the workers. It continues to be a part of the legal regime of the state. And you consider B.R. Singh in the light of the other case. And that is Rangarajan's case. We showed complete ignorance of the Supreme Court on the question of what is the importance of strike and how the workers across the world had to face the trials and tri tribulations in order to secure this legitimate weapon in the armory. When to be pressed, how to be pressed can be regulated by law, but you cannot take away this right. Now this code has brought in completely different perspective of it and that is not acceptable. Under the Industrial Disputes Act, the definition of strike was in section 2Q. But here we have in 2ZK, which is of course reproduction substantially of that definition, but it has also brought in one important facet that is Casual, you know, when workers resort to concerted, apply for concerted casual leave under a prayer concert. And it says if more than 50% of the workers have applied for a casual leave under a concert, it shall be treated as a strike. I have no problems on that. But what it does is, it makes completely obliterates the distinction between public utility and non-public utility. And it applies the law uniformly to all industrial establishments, whether public utility or non-public utility. And wants to make notice as a precondition for going on strike. Now, this is something which is, if you see the scheme of the act, the workers can never go on strike. And strike will always be illegal. The Supreme Court worked very hard to bring in a concept of legal and justified strike. Legal and unjustified strike. Illegal and unjustified strike. Illegal and not per per perfectly unjustified strike. Now this is Gujarat Steel Tubes case, Greaves Cotton, all cases uh, you know that you can read. I uh, you go to you have to go to Umesh Nayak's case. You have to go to. Kelewala's case, all these cases you will go, I need not to go into these cases, but my submission is this. If you make the distinction between public utility and non-public utility to go and make everybody to go on strike only after giving notice, which shall not be less than 14 days, it is impossible for 
workers to agitate very important matters which require immediate attention. All strikes are going to be illegal. And, you know, it is not only that workers are put in a uh, bad condition. And management is also put in a bad condition. Like, suppose, workers resort to some sabotages or some disciplinary issues. The employer could declare a lockout. But now he cannot declare a lockout unless he gives notice. Every lockout will be illegal. It is only when a strike is followed by a lockout that the lockout becomes legal. Workers do not go on strike, but they do all things. Short of strike, but everything to create problems for the management. You hold, uh, get out the people inside, but he cannot declare a lockout. So I think, again, there has been no proper thinking on the subject on the part of the lawmakers. Therefore, that dichotomy, that earlier distinction between public utility and non-public utility should not have gone. We should have strengthened the law, but not done away completely with that two purposive uh, aspects that we have uh, talked about. I think that is something which needs to be again relooked, and I don't think we have been able to, uh, 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 the legislature has been able to deal with this aspect uh, in a very elaborate manner. Now, another feature that I think you need to look at is, I think that's a much talked about aspect. I will uh, take only two issues because I know that the time is uh, running out and I need to take some questions also from you, but two important facets I would like certainly to take up. You see, we make a distinction between contractual appointments and contract labor. Issue of regularization. Now, if you have a look at uh, this new uh, code, this new code has also brought in something what we call as fixed term employments. It's not a new concept. People say a new concept has been evolved. I don't think it's a new concept at all. Because if you remember in 1982, after the decision of the Supreme Court in Sundramuni's case, when this person put in 240 days by last nine days appointment to make it a one year of continuous service and Supreme Court in Sundramani's case said termination does not mean only where the employer passes an active order or takes an active step to bring a termination of the service. Termination can take place by a flux of time, by stipulation in the contract of employment. And that is where, you know, you understand Sundramani's case talked about a flux of time, contractual appointment fixed term appointment, employment. So it is not a new concept. And it was given a statutory recognition in amending section 200 after Sundramani's case to overrule one aspect of the Sundramani's case Supreme Court brought in the exclusion categories 200 BB, where it said that if there is by a flux of time or stipulation in the contract of employment, it shall not be deemed to be retrenchment. So it was not a concept which was alien. It's a concept which was very much there. But what has been done in Section 2 double Again, a very clumsy uh, drafting. How can you bring in definition class entitlements of the uh, you know, uh, fixed term employment? You make a straight provision for that. And, you know, the problem of fixed term employment does not come in private employments. It is more a problem in public employments. What the government does is, even if they have the regular posts, they will make appointments on fixed term employment uh, contract basis. And then the people will go to the court and say, look here, I was entitled to the regular employment. These people are giving me fixed term 
employment, this is unfair labor practice. Courts will say lift the veil. Was there a post which was available? Why did you appoint him on a fixed term basis when there was an available post? You should have appointed him on a regular basis. Why did you not appoint him on a regular basis? Now, what they're trying to do is very, 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 you know, uh, uh, cleverly, craftily. They say, all right, fixed term contract will get the same wages as the regular employee. Same hours of work, same facilities, even gratuity he will get reduced to it uh, one by fifth. But I think it raises more issues. It raises issues of conscious decision of the employer. If there are posts available, why should you make fixed term employments? Will you get any uh, you know, advantage before the court by saying now that we have a definition of fixed term employment, so therefore we can appoint people even if we have the regular post? I think this is going to be a very, very uh, strongly debated area. It is not acceptable, cannot be acceptable. It is denial of entitlements of the workers. If there are posts which are available against which a worker should be appointed, you should not be allowed to make appointments on fixed term basis in spite of the fact that you may have given some uh, benefits under that definition, which of course should not have been there. There should have been a separate provision to this effect and operative provision of the statute dealing with these aspects. And third aspect that I would like to say, and that is perhaps the last aspect I would like to talk about, is what is the COVID-19 experience? Has it been reflected in this legislation? We are now mostly work from home. Workplace has changed. Regulation of employment at work place at home and therefore the law has to respond to those situations and there has to be reflection there has to be thinking of making law because i am sure <clears throat> work from home will come to stay if not for all but some of the places it is very economic for employers to employ people on virtual mode. And therefore, virtual mode also needs to be regulated. I know today how much of pressure you build on the people who have to work from home. There is hardly any recreation. There is hardly any time. It is over time, over time, over time that the person has to do. So therefore, this aspect needs to be taken care of if you have to bring a law which is a future law which is a law which has to respond to the felt necessities of time but of late what we have found on the one hand you are talking about bringing codes but on the other hand you are talking about bringing ordinances exercising powers under section 5 of the factories act diluting the rights of the workers but this is a process which cannot be allowed if you remember a shared workers case, an attempt made by the Supreme Court to lift the labor rights to the fundamental rights. And Supreme Court said, let me draw your attention to some cases and two, three cases. I would not like to devote more time on that, but some basic foundational jurisprudence. I would like you to have a look and read these quotes in the light of those experiences. I start my first presentation with a case which came in 1949 before Federal Court of India, we subsequently became the Supreme Court of India. It was a beautiful case which laid down the basic labor jurisprudence in this country. And it was the case of Western India Automobile Association. And it is here that the Supreme Court for the first time was dealing with whether Labor court has the power to order reinstatement, back wages, continuity of service where there is a termination which is illegal or an unfair labor practice. As something unique thing happened in this judgment when the Supreme Court said, Federal Court said, Labor Court has enormous powers. When I say Labor Court, I say industrial adjudicator has enormous powers. It said industrial adjudicator can rewrite the contract of employment. 
it can modify the contract of employment it can order reinstatement back wages continuity of service and therefore industrial disputes act became an exception to what we say personal contracts are not specifically enforceable and therefore you see we raised industrial disputes act to the pedestal of article 311 where we say statutory rights that flow under article 311 is an exception to uh, you know that principle now that personal contracts cannot be specifically enforced therefore industrial disputes act statutory provisions statutory bodies are covered by this exception this was a found foundation of the labor jurisprudence laid down it is a unique law laid down in india only that labor courts have the power to order reinstatement back wages continuity of service another aspect that i think i need to look at is was the bharat bank of india 1950 that was the first of the cases decided by the supreme court of india on article 136 when the supreme court was dealing with its own powers but its own powers were subject to the limitation when it said that supreme court may grant special leave to appeal against any judgment order determination sentence award of a court or tribunal because it has to be court or tribunal if it is not a court or tribunal it has no power to grant special leave to appeal the question was what is tribunal the court interpreted by majority in bharat bank's case the tribunal means not only judicial body but also quasi judicial bodies and labor courts industrial tribunals are quasi judicial bodies they do not automatically bind the workers or employers because that has to be award has to be published and it has to become enforceable in certain cases the government can modify the order so this is a discussion that you will find in bharat bank's case a beautiful case that is uh, and that is the case which gave supreme court power to entertain specially appeals against directly from labor court and industrial tribunals and that was the time when supreme court did not have many cases but it started entertaining cases right from the labor court and industrial tribunal and got an opportunity to lay down uniform and scientific based law on industrial relation in this country wage structures dearness allowance gratuity industry industrial disputes act trade unions it was the supreme court which became the real architect and its decisions though relating to the roots before the constitution of india came into force or we attained our independence 26 trade unions and 26 industrial disputes act industrial laws they were decisions which were influenced by the constitution values and decided on constitution values and you know supreme court taking judicial notice of the 1947 amendment to the trade unions act supreme court taking judicial notice of the fair wage bill that was introduced in the house earlier in 1948 and built up the law on living wage fair wage minimum wage and in ajay uh, edward wills and uh, bijay cotton wills when the constitutional validity of the minimum wage is 48 was challenged before the supreme court supreme court said you have to pay minimum wages irrespective of the capacity of the employer to pay because right to carry on business does not mean right to exploit if an employer cannot pay minimum wage is fixed under the act which is irrespective of his capacity to pay he has no right to exist now these are the beautiful judgments and then supreme court saying if the strike is legal and justified workers are entitled to wages during the strike period it is a social security try to be built up in a country where there were no provisions of the social security during the strike period workers had nothing to fall back upon therefore workers would be too uh, difficult it would be difficult for them to participate in uh, legal and justified strikes to further their legitimate trade union objectives this was again a contribution made by the supreme court supreme court again building up a law on unfair labor practices till a new chapter was brought in the industrial disputes act taking again a clue from 1947 and you know if you remember the case uh, ramakrishna's case supreme court saying that even though the then the Com- companies act of 1956 did not make a provision for workers uh, to bring a winding up petition against the uh, contest the winding up petition or be party to the winding up petition because their livelihood was involved so therefore they have a right to stay say they said it may not be giving them the right but it does not deny them the right 
the court said right to livelihood is a fundamental right therefore workers must be heard before uh, you know winding up proceedings are uh, decision is taken by the courts company courts in the matter these are beautiful judgments then you have a shared workers case supreme court raising minimum wages to the pedestal of if you pay less than minimum wages it is amounting to slavery it is begar and it is prohibited by the constitution as a fundamental right rights of the workers of the children if you employ child labor it is violative of the fundamental rights of the children a very beautiful jurisprudence that was developed but then came balco supreme court again made a reversal up brass air company ke supreme court again made a reversal but i think we are today at a stage where we have to debate on all the moves that the government is bringing you have recently a judgment of justice chandrachud questioning the notification issued by section 5 of the factories act where he said this goes contrary to the fundamental rights of the workers because you cannot extend the hours of work which is in violation of the international law and domestic law you cannot deny uh, you know overtime uh, wages to the workers by uh, you know just giving them hourly wages uh, without uh, following the provisions of the these are some very important aspects i think that we all need to do and if we have to understand plight of the workers in this concern covid 19 has taught us many lessons and we have to learn from those lessons and the law that we have to make has to be a wholesome law which will not only provide for normal situations it must also provide a reflect for the abnormal situations like what we faced in the last 2 3 years what the workers faced in the last 2 years what the plight of the family has been their families have been in last 2 years how the economy has been uh, you know suffering all these years we have to make a concerted attempt to make a law which is rational which is scientific based and which is creating an environment for workers and employers and the society to coexist i think that's what i have to say today thank you very much now if uh, if any students have any questions they can put that in the chat section wonderful keynote address sir by the time is student they ask and we we'll request you to come on campus uh, whenever campus students are on campus because i remember your afternoon class in full in uh, room number 402 once you told i'll come in afternoon and, and i'll I, i'll see if students are interested and who have my uh, pleasant surprise they were in the room was back It seems there are no questions. There are, are there questions. Sir, it takes time. Actually, okay. we, have, okay. we, we put there. No, I just wanted uh, people to ask questions, more questions than uh, rather I give a monologue. You know? yeah. I, I always like yeah. to answer more questions. Doctor Call, you can. Uh, Doctor Rohin, you can uh, read the question from. Chat. Anirudh, uh, Anirudh, uh, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Anirudh, uh, something uh, you just uh, carry forward this uh, question and answer uh, question and answer session because there is some uh, uh, issue with the chat section over my laptop. Sure, sir. Uh, uh, sir, the question to you is. Uh, shouldn't the supreme court under self cognizance strike down the clause of prior notice of strike under the ambit of the new code since it's clear violation of right to strike of worker unions yeah, well i think uh, supreme court cannot do that you know uh, unless uh, you have very strong judges there who feel that this is uh, something unreasonable but you know this is not a fundamental right right to strike is not a fundamental right so therefore uh, you cannot uh, say that my fundamental right has been violated you have to decide it on other uh, you know strong uh, foundations uh, i personally feel that uh, 
by making all strikes illegal by not giving notice is something which is not practicable it is you see i always say and this is what i said all laws are subordinate to strength of the union and strength of the employer might don't allow might is right to be the predominant law of the state if you make a bad law people will not follow it and this law will come in disrepute it's as good as having no law on that subject so all strikes will be illegal so what will you do now again another aspect that i would like to say is if you see another aspect in this new code is the punishments are now in the form of money i remember one of the cases uh, that went to the supreme court justice bhagwati in salal hydro project where the migrant workers cases were dealt with by him he said labor law has to be very deterrent uh, because if you violate the rights of the workers you must visit with a strong penalties not penalties in the form of money always the employer can pay but once you have imprisonment other things there so, so, you know uh, larger uh, days of imprisonment i think and if it is if you are able to operationalize that law i think that is that is not that should not be given up what has happened is in the penalties provisions that you will see now it is all in terms of money it is failing which and other things that they will say sometimes uh, imprisonment but i think that that itself is needs a further examination okay. other thing you see that uh, retrenchment uh, that chapter 5b of the industrial disputes act which talked about uh, prayer permission in case of uh, layoff retrenchment and closure now that was uh, 100 workers now it has been raised to 300 workers now what what we are doing is unless instead of making the law much simpler so that the employer applies you have you uh, you know uh, go into the prima facie question if there is a valid uh, reason or invalid reason and decide to decide yes or no uh, then you do deal with that but then by uh, taking it to 100 to 300 and then many of the cases i think the law will not be applicable and that rigor i think uh, this provision kept india in a good state when whole world was facing a difficult time in the matter of uh, you know economic crisis i i have a very strong uh, view on this matter but i think uh, let students have their own views on the matter yes sir so another question is uh, regarding a clarity so i want a clarity that there is no clarity on recognizing center for providing welfare scheme so the bills have not clearly specified the notice relating to security schemes health and safety standards no those and are why uh, the safety code safety code is taking care of that i am not on that code today i am dealing only with the industrialization code we have a separate code uh, you know that safety and uh, safety code itself is a separate code itself which takes care of the factories and welfare legislation so that, that's a very comprehensive code. so we need to have some other time on that aspect but today we are only dealing with the area of industrial relations which is basically consolidation and amending of law of trade unions act industrial employment standing order act and the industrial disputes act right in particular so if you may allow there is one more question yeah 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 so very often the spikes conducted by private hospital staff results to the death of vulnerable patients so isn't this new provision of prior notice is you a see, you see hospitals are public utility services and there was a strong law uh, if you see uh, i don't get time to demonstrate to you i wanted to have that time to demonstrate to you it is not possible to go on strike in public utility services you give a notice which will be valid for 6 weeks past for, for for first 14 days you do not you have no right to go on strike that is the time when you give a notice under section 20 of the industrial disputes act conciliation proceedings are deemed to have commenced and once conciliation proceedings are deemed to have commenced you cannot go on strike during the pendency of the conciliation proceedings and you cannot go on strike during the period of conciliation proceedings in 7 days thereafter 
Seven days is a time for the government to make a mind whether to refer or not to refer the dispute. If you are able to make a refer or a dispute in seven days' time, then you cannot go on strike when the matter is pending before the labor court and two months thereafter. Two months is because you have 30 days for publication of the award and 30 days for the enforceability of the award. And award becomes enforceable and you cannot go on strike when the award is enforced. It is in force. So therefore, you cannot go on strike in public utility services. But problem is, conciliation officer does not give his report in time. Government does not consider it in time. Labor court does not decide it in time. Government does not publish it in time. It does not become enforceable in time. And therefore, the problem is that even in public utility services, there are gaps where the workers can resort to strike. That is where they become unjustified. If later on, question of legality or illegality is a question of law. Question of justifiedness or unjustifiedness is a question of fact. So whether the strike is legal or not is a question of law. <coughs> Have you adhered to 22, 23? That is the question. That is law. Whether it is justified will decide from case to case, depend upon case to case. And that will be decided by the court on the justification. But if you say now notice has to be given in all that is something which is misreading of the situation. You cannot do it. I say, I agree with you that the workers should not go on strike in hospitals. It will lead to the death. You see, again, I am telling you one very important aspect that the students must read and the students and teachers must read. Now you cannot divide. You cannot uh, teach labor law without teaching consumer protection law. A labor union may resort to an action but if it inconveniences the consumer, consumer has a right against the trade union. And again, insolvency uh, law, that code, recently Supreme Court judgment has come where a worker, workers union have been held to have a locus in the insolvency proceedings against that company if they have withheld their salaries and other things. So a labor law student now has to study law not in the light of codes only. You have to read it in the context of other laws also because consumer protects the rights of the society. Labor protects the rights of the society, rights of the employer, rights of the workers. And if you read Rota's Industry Staff Association case, the court has said that I, in Trade Unions Act, Industrial Disputes Act has not been passed in the interest only in the interest of labor and employer. It has been passed primarily with the interest of the society in mind so that the society is not inconvenienced by disruption in supply of goods and services. That is why participation in an illegal strike or lockout is a punishable offense under the Industrial Disputes Act because it's a wrong against the society and society punishes you by way of a no, corporal uh, punishment, fine if you participate in an illegal strike. So you must have a very compact view of the whole subject. Industrial Disputes Act is society oriented. Availability of goods and services without disruptions, minimum, dis min minimum disruptions, minimize disruptions. That is the purpose of the act. Uh, sir, there is one more question. Kindly elaborate on the practice of contractualization of employment by employers and how it is affecting the fundamental rights of employees and even in case of permanent employment. You see, the city has. You see, there is a right to livelihood, yes, but I don't think there's a there's a fundamental right to permanent employment. See, if there are no permanent posts, how can you employ people on permanent employment? But question is, you should not leave scope for the employers, especially, as I said, it is in public employments. You should not allow them to create a camouflage, create a smoke screen. And that's why we have imported uh, a corporate law principle of lifting of veil in labor law. Courts can go into the question as to whether employment of contractual employees is a purpose is, is purposely brought in to defeat the rights of the workers to the permanent employment. 
and that is why there is a post available why did you fill it by contractual employment in fact there are cases which have already gone to the supreme court supreme court has held that if the court is satisfied that the worker was appointed on contractual basis though there was a position available and he was eligible in all respects he should have been appointed uh, uh, against the regular americans those are very well settled law uh, uh, there is no a doubt about those question yes sir so these are the question uh, which were raised by uh, if you may allow uh, in the proceed with uh, the vote of thanks okay uh, sir uh, am i audible yeah 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 okay sir uh, with your permission uh, should we proceed to vote of thanks are you not have to thank me here i am a part of you okay sir <laughs> uh, sir has uh, respected beauty goal sir has given a very in depth uh, comparative analysis of the present existing law and the new labor codes and sir has raised uh, raised very important issues with respect to these codes and uh, there should be some liability on the government that these uh, uh, issues need to be looked so that the courts become employment friendly so on this note i once again convey my thanks to respected uh, professor bt kohl sir uh, for giving an in depth analysis on the subject matter thanks a lot sir thank you very much thank you thank you thank, thank you sir you. thank you dr rohin for my thank, thank you thank you thanks a lot thank you very much sir thank you sir thank thank uh, thank you anirudh and thank you thanks, thank you sir thanks anirudh for wonderful comparing thank you sir okay bye bye thank sir. you sir thank you sir